What is up, YouTube? It's your girl Miranda here with a special video coming at you. Uh, we're here to talk about the new Nebula Original Identities, a short film directed and written by Jesse Earl, also known as Jesse Gender here on YouTube. I swear this isn't a channel where I make essays about Nebula Originals. It just kind of worked out that way that both this film and The Prince got my creative juices flowing. Uh, go watch my video on The Prince, by the way. It's really good. Um, I have no connection to Nebula beyond just knowing a few of their creators. Although, uh, Dave Whiskus, if you're watching this, feel free to slide into my DMs. As you may have guessed from my opening bit, this is not going to be an impersonal objective review. For full disclosure, Jesse is a close friend of mine and part of my chosen family. We've appeared in each other's videos and she's my biggest inspiration for getting into the video essay space. I even came close to appearing in this film as an extra. This is all to say that I will make no pretense of objectivity, and I hope I've been very clear in disclosing my bias here. That being said, this movie is good. Go watch it, forehead. I super double especially recommend this film if you identify as non-binary, love someone who's non-binary, or are still figuring yourself out. This is going to be a much more personal video than what I originally envisioned. We're going to go to some dark places. This is a video about joy, however, so I promise you there's light at the end of the tunnel. In the words of my favorite comedian, we're going into the depths of Mordor, but after that, we're going right back to the Shire. If you're worried about spoilers for the film, well, first of all, go watch it. But if you're dying to see this video first for some reason, I only briefly discuss basic story details, and I guarantee you will still enjoy it after having seen this video. All right, jack me into the Ventiverse. So I went on a little journey with this film. No, I meant like a literal journey. I got on a plane and flew out to Los Angeles to attend the premiere in person. If you don't know Deep Channel lore, I used to be a pro Magic the Gathering player back in the day, so I've done a fair amount of traveling in a previous life. I used to love jet sitting around the world, but it's the sort of thing that can really burn you out if you do too much of it. There was a period of my life where I was driving or flying somewhere for some tournament every other weekend. That said, I've been on some pretty amazing trips in my time. I swam the beaches of Waikiki and got preemptively banned from a Honolulu strip club. I got high in the red light district of Amsterdam. I've partied in all you can drink bars in Japan. And then I went back to school and no longer had the disposable income to travel. After that, I only traveled for work a couple of times. And well, you might remember a global event not too long ago that made traveling very difficult. Even when things started opening up, by then I developed a pretty severe anxiety disorder and became borderline agoraphobic. Even now, I can't drive for more than an hour by myself. I didn't start traveling again until last year. I was able to go visit my sister, who was about a five hour drive for me. I reckoned I could take the train, so at least I could be on my phone or have a nap if the anxiety got to be too much. Later that year, I got on a plane for the first time in several years, and for the first time since I transitioned. It was to go to Seattle Trans Pride, where I tabled for the podcast I co-host with my dear friend, Gender Measter. It's a good podcast, by the way. Go subscribe on YouTube or wherever you download your podcasts. I also got to meet Jessie in person for the first time, and was lucky enough to spend a day with her, where I think we really bonded. This year, I ramped up my travel, having been to Las Vegas, Chicago, and now Los Angeles. While this most recent trip was short, it was still one of the most amazing trips I've ever had. I went to a fucking Hollywood red carpet premiere. I watched a building burn down on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, welcome to Los Angeles, I guess. I spent time with my chosen family in person and told them how much I love them. And I got to be with one of my best friends on the happiest day of her life so far. It's a surreal experience being at a fancy event with Hollywood stars and famous YouTubers you look up to. Overwhelming, really. My brain couldn't really handle it and my social anxiety went into overdrive. I'm sure this is relatable to a lot of you, but being at a big party where the only person you know is the host is hard. I didn't get to talk to many of the people there I wanted to talk to, and I felt super awkward the whole time, and I did the old Irish goodbye when I hit my limits. And you know what? 
I don't really give a shit. It was worth it. I do it a million times over. Anxiety really fucking sucks, but I'll be damned if I was going to let it get in the way of this. This film also took me on a metaphorical journey. The central premise is that our two main characters, male and female aspects of the same being, are faced with the choice of which of them is allowed to continue living. The characters are physically separated, first by an invisible barrier, then by a two-way mirror. The mirrored imagery is one I resonate with a lot. I've often framed my own transition as going through the looking glass. In a more literal sense, I've had a difficult relationship with the mirror, suffering from both gender dysphoria and body dysmorphia. I'm someone that internalizes their faults and tends to blame themselves for them. Thanks, mom and dad. I've not so jokingly thought of writing, you're looking at the problem on my mirror. It's taken a while to reach the point where I can look into the mirror and see me. Not a stranger, not someone I hate. Many films use this sort of mirrored imagery, which often reflects the cis person's idea of identity. To use another metaphor, the fork in the road only has two branches. That's not just a gender thing, it's pervasive to our society. When you meet someone for the first time, inevitably, one of the first questions they ask you is, what do you do? As if your occupation is your entire identity. And maybe for some people it is, I guess. I don't know, I've never defined myself by my job. The office is just somewhere I go to have money to pay rent and eat and donate to Patreons and fundraisers. What do I do? I don't know, man. A lot of things. Sometimes nothing. Identities rejects this framing of having to choose one thing to be and presents a beautiful synthesis of choices. Obviously in the context of gender, but if you use your imagination, you can apply this framework to so much more. I spoke at length about this in my video about the prince, that society chooses for us the role that we play at birth. Transness is the rejection of being told what we are and embracing what we actually want to be. If the ventiverse is a metaphor for societal expectations, then the other place, or whatever it's called, represents our true selves, unshackled by what others want for us, where we can truly be free. This isn't the most subtle metaphor in the world, but that's the point. It's why it's resonated so strongly with my non-binary friends. And despite being totally okay with they, them pronouns, I don't identify as non-binary, so it hit very differently for me. Not any less hard, just different. As I said before, this framework can apply to anyone, really. It just chooses to focus on the non-binary experience. We all choose which door to walk through at some point in our lives, whether consciously or not, whether deliberately or not. When I got back to my hotel room after seeing the film, I spent a long time in bed thinking about the choices I've made in life and what my avatar would have gone through within the Ventiverse. Unlike the characters in the film, I wasn't in a state of tabula rasa when I chose my door. I imagine no one is, except maybe for folks who realize they're trans at a very young age. Bless their souls. No, I had a half a lifetime of memories and experiences already. Well, one of my avatars did anyway. The other had been silently screaming for decades, begging to be heard. It was as if my female avatar was a ghost, able to see the world but completely unable to be seen by it, but for the tiny signs left behind. A gust of wind, a whisper in the distance, that queer feeling that you're not alone. And yet she persisted. The whisper became louder until it became a scream. Help! I'm alive! When I cracked my egg, he noticed her. Really noticed her for the first time. That's the point where I materialized in the stark white room of the Ventiverse. That's when I had to choose my door.
And well, you already know what I chose. It wasn't that difficult. The man I was had been miserable without ever understanding why. He didn't want to go on living that way. At least now, he could die for something. Old man dies, young girl lives. Fair trade. An old man dies, young woman lives. Fair trade. After some amount of soul searching, I made my choice and didn't look back. But he didn't just become one with the force or whatever. I've had to drag his corpse around like an albatross around my neck. I've only been Miranda publicly for a little over three years. Almost everything in my life belonged to him. I have his friends, his career, his hobbies. I have his body, although I've made some modifications. <laughs> I don't have a whole lot that only belongs to me. Just me, Miranda. We, uh, later in life, trans, share this experience of deep regret for the life that could have been. I know what you're going to say. I've heard every platitude that there is. You don't transition until you're ready. You can't change the past. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. There is a kernel of truth to it, of course. I'm forced to accept the consequences of the choice I've made because what else can I do? It doesn't erase the regret, however. My dear friend Aranok had this to say on the subject in a recent video, which you should all go watch, by the way. Trauma didn't make me stronger or better. It wasn't a gift. It was just trauma. But whether I like it or not, whether it's fair or not, who I am now is in part a result of those experiences. And the good experiences, too. And if I tried to get rid of all of that, I'd have to get rid of all of the great things as well version of Aranok that got to transition early, that was never traumatized, that was never assaulted and violated and harmed, she doesn't exist and she never will. And denying that loss doesn't make it any easier. So rather than endlessly focusing on what if, I am trying to appreciate what is. And I am fighting for a world where no kid has to go through what I did. I cried for a long time after that part of the video. I cried again rewatching it for this video. I think one of the reasons she and I became such fast friends is that we get each other. Although we've had very different lives, we've both had to go through a mountain of shit to get where we are. The version of Miranda that got to transition early, that didn't have to live as a man for nearly 40 fucking years, she doesn't exist. And she never will. Although the idea of plugging into a virtual world and getting to exist as a female version of myself, free of all this baggage, free of the albatross of my former life, well, it's a temptation I don't think I could resist if it were real. I'm saddled with so much regret that in the parlance of role-playing games, starting over and rolling a new character is something I fantasize about to a degree that's probably unhealthy. I'm trying to appreciate what is but it's hard it's really 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 fucking hard my version of what is isn't all that appealing my life has absolutely been on fire this year my mental and physical health are hanging on by a thread i certainly don't want to turn this into a woe is me boohoo video <laughs> This is a video about trans joy. And who better to talk about trans joy than someone who doesn't have a lot of it in their life? I know better than most the value of joy. I fight for every tiny little fucking scrap of it I can get. I fight to give the people I love a better life than I ever had. I fight for a world where no trans child ever has to go through what I did. And my biggest source of joy is my trans found family. You know who you are because I've already talked about you in this video. I fucking love you.
I've talked a bit about my former self, how I wish I could just leave him behind. The truth is, is that I can't. He will always be a part of me. And maybe that's how it was always meant to be. I can at least choose the parts that I keep and the parts I throw away. I mean that metaphorically, and don't be gross. I choose to leave behind the toxicity, the misogyny, the desperate need to fit in where I don't belong. And the anger. Oh, fuck the anger. This might have been the testosterone rotting my brain. It might have been generational anger I inherited from my father. It could have just been the anger of being born different in a world not made for me. This might come as a shock to folks who have known me for a long time. I've always projected a sense of jovial gregariousness in public, at least in spaces where I felt comfortable doing so. Not that I was being disingenuous. I do like being the life of the party. I mean, this is mostly a comedy channel. I love to make people laugh. That's me. But that sad, angry person crying themselves to sleep most nights? That's also me. Once I started HRT, I felt that anger slipping away. I started feeling, really feeling emotions for the first time since society told me that as a man, I had to lock those away. My song went from monotone to a full symphony. And yeah, with those higher highs came lower lows. But it's better than feeling nothing. So while I can't wind back the clock and reclaim the lost years, I can at least keep the good parts of my former self. And you know what? My friends that have stuck with me through my transition are pretty cool, actually. Miranda has her own friends, too. My memories of the absolutely wild life that I've had are pretty cool, actually. Miranda, in her short life, has had some pretty wild times, too. While he developed his writing and editing skills over several years, it was Miranda that had the creative spark to make videos like the one you're watching right now. In the end, I had my own synthesis of a sort, and it took identities to make me realize it. That I don't have to carry around my own corpse, and can instead use my past life to inform and guide my future. So what is trans joy, and why is it important? Simply put, it is the joy we experience by getting to express our transness. You don't need me to tell you how hostile the world is to us right now. There are a lot of ding-dongs out there that don't want us to exist. And to them I say, fuck you. Look at us being happy. I mentioned earlier that I co-host a podcast with my dear friend, Gender Master. Again, go subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. I close out every show with my favorite question, during which I ask our guests to share an experience they've had with gender euphoria. It's my favorite question because so much of the trans experience in public discourse is framed around our suffering. I want to push back on that as much as possible, which is why it's so important to me that we share our joy. So trans folks everywhere, particularly young trans folks, can see us living our best lives and being happy. And if you're in a dark place, keep fighting until you get there. I'm saying that last bit as much to myself as anyone else. I hope I've made it clear that I've had a rough go of it, particularly these last few years. If anything, I've undersold it. There's only so much I'm willing to put out there in public for the world to see. And let's just say certain topics YouTube frowns on. The object of this is not to start a pity party. It's to reinforce how important trans joy is to me. It's scarcity in my life makes me value it that much more. If you're also having a bad time, I hope that sharing part of my story makes you feel less alone. Trans joy is out there. I promise. This is such a lovely question. Um, more trans joy is what we need. Um, I want to shout out the friends in Leeds who, when I first started saying, actually, now that I've moved here, I think they then pronouns are the right ones for me, really validated that in every um, situation and really helped me to feel 
finally comfortable in the um, gender that I was living in. As a, as a GM, I get to be a bunch of different NPCs, and I do feel gender euphoria when I play a few of my male or trans mask um, NPCs. One in particular uh, named Justice, who's this tiefling who uses a wheelchair um, like I do. When I get to be him and describe his cool outfits and talk in this slight British accent, I just, I really like being Justice. So having uh, like my friends and my lovely girlfriend just consistently get it right and I can tell that they aren't just like memorizing my pronouns, but they try to understand that I'm a non-binary person like, and it's core to my identity. Having a friend group at all is new to me, and then and then, then that on top of it, it's like, it's euphoric. The way my girlfriend looks at me. Aww. Aww. So I was trying to find out a word that in a way that I was like... Yeah. Yeah, I love that for you. They so make fun. me feel beautiful. Mm -hmm. Aww. Yeah. Adorable. I love him. <laughs> oh, the best. The, the woman takes my driver's license, and she looks at it, and she looks up at me, and she says, is this you? And I was like, yeah, unfortunately, that's me. And she's like, she didn't believe me well, that, that it was the same person. And this was only just, six months in. She thought you conveniently had a fake ID in your wallet for car accidents. Or something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like just wow. the fact that in those six months, I had changed so much that she did not recognize me as a man. Like, she thought I was a woman. And she was right. But... Yeah, just the fact that, that that moment, it was like horrible traumatic experience of a car accident, but in the middle of that was a tiny bit of gender euphoria. You wouldn't think this would be uh, validating, but they called me the B word. Mm -hmm. And I'm just sitting here and, and they probably have no idea why I'm like half smirking. And I'm like, you know what? I am a female canine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so seen. <laughs> I got to be seven to nine for Halloween. And I did the costume where I was like the silver cat suit and everything. But it was just like a cool thing to be like, I got to be seven to nine. And that was a character I never thought I would be able to, like as a kid, I never thought I'd get to play seven to nine for Halloween. And I always wanted to. And I just did this year, which was, which was really fun. It was just wonderful, like, to like be like, oh, I can do these things. And it's just sort of like something that I'm reflecting on recently about like how these things that did cause me like express gender euphoria like wearing a dress or something like that are now everyday experiences for me and how they just become casual and in its own way just recognizing how casual those elements of my life have become is its own form of gender euphoria i love you know feeling good in a well-fitted suit i just there's something about that just feels so good Whenever I go get a new suit and put it on and get it, you know, get it tailored to where it fits just right, that to me is a gender euphoria experience. The happiest day of my journey was my legal name. There's just a I don't think to me that stood out as just the quintessential, I have finally gotten here. I can enjoy how little I laugh in my life. Like actually laughed out loud until my voice started changing, and I would hear myself laugh, and I would hear myself laugh and laugh loud, and like take up space in some kind of way that I had never suddenly not just like take up space, but to to have joy in my daily life in small things that just became audible to me and then present to me because I became aware of them and those kinds of things. So just to laugh was a huge experience with gender euphoria. Anytime that I have an opportunity to sing with the altos or be included amongst the altos or uh, to conduct um, in a woman's suit or in a dress, um, it, it's not just gender euphoria, it's, it's professional validation. One day I was getting changed for the gym, and I kind of looked down and I'm just like, oh damn, my boots are looking good for you. Just throw me is the weight loss, but uh, I was just like, damn, boots are looking good. Cause like, you know, I was, I've been overweight for like my whole life and I, I had like quote unquote man boobs. And I think that was the first time that I looked at myself and I didn't see man boobs there. I saw girl boobs.
and um, I thought that they felt really nice. A lot of the times, like, I look in the mirror and I still see a man. And whenever I can look in the mirror or look at my myself and see a woman, that's, it feels incredible. It's really like, it. it's, you know, I was saying before how I really struggle with depression a lot. And that's one of the few things in my life that bring me joy is seeing myself as a woman. It's not just like something I'm pretending to be, it's something I actually am. So that's, I, yeah, that's, that's my euphoria. That's, that's my joy. That's how I define myself. But there is one Aaron who is extremely special to me. Um, and in this movie, uh, in the climax of the film, there's the guy and the girl dancing the dance sequence there. Um, and that is, as Dr. Aaron was saying, that is the sequence that I dreamed of first, um, that I thought of first. Um, and it was just one that came to me when I was just thinking about the film that got me very excited about it. for watching to the end of the video uh this is a really deeply personal video to make um my trip to la stirred up a lot of feelings in me both good and bad 
And like, if you're worried about me, I'm fine, really. I mean, not really, but I'm doing my best. If this is your first time here, I have other video essays, including the one about the prints you might like. I'm making a push to get this channel monetized, and as of filming this video, we need another 250-ish subscribers and a few more hundred hours of watch time, so every bit helps. If you like my content and want to see more, do all the YouTube things, you know, like, share, comment, subscribe, all the YouTube jabs. Take care, everyone. See you next time. Okay, bye-bye.